Good morning, Pastor Horn here. The sermon this morning is based on Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Last week was Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary's Assignment Day, which is an answer to our prayers. Jesus told us, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the harvest field. It's from Matthew chapter 9. Last week, Thursday, 33 men were assigned to congregations and schools around the world to serve as pastors. As shepherds of their flock, they have been called to proclaim the entire will of God, to proclaim who God is, that, that he's triune, that he's three persons in one God. And even though our human understanding cannot understand it, it is a truth that we believe by faith. And this is a high calling to proclaim God's truths to God's people, to reach out to the unchurched with those same truths about God. And as someone who has gone through this process, for the most part, their call, those seminary students, their call has a lot of unanswered questions. Of course, there is this call packet that they will receive. It's filled with information about the congregation and the new community that they're going to move to, but they they really don't know what's waiting for them until they have immersed themselves into their congregation and in their community. This morning, our reading is a very similar situation. The Lord called a man to be a pastor to his people, the nation of Israel. But the future of this man's ministry had some question marks. In the last verse of our reading, we read that King Uzziah had died when he had been anointed king of Judah, he was only 16 years old, but he reigned for 52 years. In spite of his youth, he did some great things during his reign. He was powerful and faithful to the Lord for the most part. But his success got to him, and in his pride, he did something bad. He went into the temple in Jerusalem and burned incense on the altar in the temple. He might think, well, that's not so bad. But God had a rule, and only the priests were allowed to perform that duty. So God struck the king with leprosy as discipline, and he lived the rest of his life in seclusion. But while he was in seclusion, there was unrest in the nation. Enemy nations were rising to power and threatened to attack God's people. And a new king, although he was only 25 years old, would not be so faithful and successful. The future of Isaiah's ministry was uncertain. How could this young preacher handle this congregation, an entire nation? God wanted to remind his prophet Isaiah that although Israel's king was dead, Israel's God was alive. Although Israel's king who sat on the throne, this one, would not be faithful, Israel's God would sit on the throne forever and ever and he would be faithful. And he would empower his prophet Isaiah for ministry. And he did it through this fantastic vision. In his vision, Isaiah saw the king, the Lord, in all of his glory, high and exalted, sitting on his throne for all people to see. And the train of his robe, robe filled the temple. This is a king who is not relegated to just one static place. His glory fills the earth and the heavens. And in this vision, Isaiah saw above the Lord seated on his throne, seraphim. Seraphim is another name for angels, perhaps an angel of high rank among the army of angels. And typically when you see pictures of angels, they have two wings. Well, these angels each had six wings. With two wings, they were flying. With two, they covered their faces. And with two, they covered their feet. Because even the angels know who God is. God is their creator. He is holy and all-powerful, and so they showed modesty and humility by covering their face and their feet in the presence of God. And they cried out in this antiphonal angelic hymn, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. This answers our question in the theme for the sermon this morning, Who is God? He is three times holy. He is our triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
with each person of the Trinity possessing divine attributes, divine characteristics, and divine names. Three persons, yet one God. And he is the Lord, the God of free and faithful grace. He is the Lord Almighty, literally the Lord of hosts. He is the master of spiritual beings, possessing absolute power and rule over all creatures and all nations. And at the sound of their voices, at the sound of the angel singing this song, the temple was rocked and was shaking, was filled with smoke, a very frightening scene. And no wonder Isaiah immediately cried, Woe to me, I am ruined. Literally, I am destroyed. Why? Because my eyes have seen the king. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I, I've met some famous people like celebrities and athletes and nothing to brag about. But when this has happened, because it just happens by accident, my eyes typically pop open because I can't believe that I'm actually meeting this person. And my lips kind of stammer and I struggle to, to say anything coherent. But this vision brings that to another level. Isaiah is seeing not a celebrity, not a professional athlete, but God himself, the king, seated on his throne. And Isaiah talks as if he is going to die because he knows who God is. God is holy and unapproachable by sinful human beings. God's standard is holiness. So what does he expect from those who are going to be in his presence? Holiness and perfection. God hates sin and must destroy it. God must punish sin. And if he did not, he would cease to be holy. Isaiah was fully aware of his sinfulness and the gulf of sin that separated him from his God and the sobering realization that he is standing in the presence of holiness and that he is a sinner. He must confess his sin. I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. That makes me wonder, what had Isaiah said that would make him confess this particular sin, the sin of the tongue? I don't know what Isaiah said, but I can guess. I can guess from the words that have slipped past these lips. The unintentional, well-meaning words that turned out to be hateful and harmful. Words of resentment. Words of anger. Words that were spoken that should not have been. And so I say with Isaiah, woe to me, I am a man of unclean lips. What God demands of his shepherds from his pastors, he also demands from his people. Are you a man of unclean lips? Are you a woman of unclean lips? Are you, are you a child with unclean lips? The thrice holy God requires perfection and holiness to leave those lips. And God's not just addressing profanity, he, but the way that you say words. He demands that you speak words with love and with humility and respect, especially to those in authority, to your parents and to your pastor and to your teachers, to police officers and judges and board members of your homeowners association and your boss. And he demands that you apologize with sincerity. To speak in a way that builds others up. Sometimes what makes these lips unclean aren't the things that haven't passed through these lips, but or, or, I'm sorry, the, the, sometimes what makes these lips unclean are the things that haven't passed through these lips. The opportunity to offer comfort to someone who is hurting. The opportunity to invite someone to church. The opportunity to forgive and you have let all of those pass by and nothing came out of your lips. Or when you've opened your lips to make a pledge to God. This is how much of our income we're going to give back to our king as our tribute, our thanks to him. But we haven't followed through. And there are no number of bars of soap stuck in my mouth. No amount of Orbit's chewing gum or bottles of Listerine that will cleanse these unclean lips, but more importantly, my unclean heart. God is holy. I am not. God is holy, and with a holiness that makes me tremble, but also with a holiness that extends cleansing for this unclean heart and these unclean lips. 
In his vision, Isaiah cries out, Woe to me, I am ruined. And immediately God acts, and he shows us who he is. Now, now kids, please don't try this at home. Please don't do this. Remember, Isaiah is seeing a vision, and in his vision he sees a seraph, one of the angels, flying above the throne, and he flies to the altar in the temple, and he takes a live burning coal, a red-hot coal from the altar with tongs, and he puts it in his hands, and he touches Isaiah's lips with it. Please don't do that at home, kids. But he takes this burning red hot coal and he touches it to Isaiah's lips and he says, your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Isaiah immediately understood the symbolism of this vision. The Lord had given his people an annual ceremony called the Day of Atonement. And every year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would select two goats. One was the scapegoat. And what the priest would do is he would confess the sins of the nation and he would place his hands on the goat's head as he confessed those sins. And somebody would tie a rope around that goat's neck and he would lead them out of the temple courts, out of the city of Jerusalem, out into the wilderness and leave him out there abandoned to die. It's a pretty neat picture, isn't it? That God is saying, I'm taking your sins and have putting them away from you. I don't see them anymore. We go back to the temple. There's that other goat there. That other goat was slaughtered and his blood was collected in a bowl. And the priest then went to the altar in front of the temple and he took some burning coals from the altar with tongs and put them in a bucket. And with the blood in a bowl and with his hands holding a bucket full of burning coals in the other hand, he entered into the temple and he walked that length of the first room. And as he stood in at the end of that room, was a giant curtain from floor to ceiling. And he set that bucket of burning coals behind the, the curtain and he threw a handful of incense into that bucket so that the coals interacted with that incense and smoke filled that inner room, which was called the Holy of Holies. And then as the priest walked behind that curtain, as smoke filled that Holy of Holies, he took blood and he sprinkled it out in front of him as he walked behind that curtain, and he walked up to the Ark of the Covenant, that gold-covered box, the presence of the Lord himself, and he sprinkled blood on the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. God was teaching his people that no one can enter the presence of a holy God and live. Thus the smoke. The smoke hides the sinner, in a sense. The sinner can stand in the presence of a holy God, or I'm sorry, no sinner can stand in the presence of a holy God without payment for sin. God was teaching his people that there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. Sin must be atoned for. It must be paid for. It must be covered. And in order for that to happen, someone must die. Isaiah knew that the sacrifices of goats and lambs and bulls was a picture of of the sacrifice yet to come. The Holy Spirit enabled Isaiah to write about it. And in chapter 53, Isaiah says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. You see what's happening here is Isaiah is able to see the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the altar of the cross 740 years before it even happened. Isaiah saw that he could offer nothing and that he was nothing before God, but that God was and is and will be everything for him, for you. And isn't that why Isaiah was privileged to see this vision and write it down just for us? To show us that on our own, that whatever that we have done, that we are nothing before a holy God and that he is absolutely everything for us. Our holy triune God, the Father, in his wisdom, planned out your salvation. And God the Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, came down to earth to carry out that plan. And God the Holy Spirit created faith in your heart to believe it, and to be saved. And now from the lips of God, he says to you and he says to me, your guilt is taken away, your sin atoned for. 
Just as that goat was led outside of the city to die, God the Father conferred on the head of Jesus the guilt of the world, and then he led him outside of the city to die. God has removed your guilt. And just as that other goat was slaughtered as the atonement sacrifice, Jesus was slaughtered and his blood was sprinkled before God in the presence of heaven. The Lamb's blood has covered over all things, over all of the things that your lips have said in anger, over all of the things that your lips have said in jealousy and in resentment. The blood of Jesus has washed over the things that your lips have failed to say. The blood of Jesus has cleansed your heart and your lips so that you stand before the throne of the King confident, forgiven, and loved. And that's why when the king spoke from his throne and asked, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Isaiah immediately raised his hand and he spoke with confidence and conviction. He said, Here am I, send me. It didn't matter how many years of schooling that he had, how many world mission visits or home visits or door-to-door canvassing calls that he had made. His confidence was to speak up and to be a prophet for the king come from God saying to you, your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Today, the king is seated on his throne and he asks the same question of you and me. Who will go for us? Who will go for us, the Trinity, seated on his throne in all power and glory, reigning over all things, yet he chooses to use you and to use me, to use your lips and my lips to speak his praise and to say to people, your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. That's the kind of God you have, the kind of king that you have, a king who uses his people, fragile clay jars that we are, to speak about what we have seen and what we have heard. Will you answer the call of the king and confidently say, here am I, send me. Of course you will, because Jesus has taken away your guilt and he has atoned for your sins. And so we say with the psalm writer, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Amen.